unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Today, I was led to teach about the law of deliverance. I believe last week I made mention of something when I made the statement and said that there cannot be true deliverance without transformation. What is deliverance in the New Testament dispensation? When we talk about deliverance, what do we mean? Because there's many ideas, there's many things today in the body of Christ that are called deliverance. And um, I have a story I have shared once or twice before. My first encounter and exposure, you know, to this whole mind of deliverance was a very uh, misled experience. And I'm um, taken to this wonderful church. They, were, they had what they called a deliverance week. And then I bought myself a blue book. I've kept that book since then. It's many years ago, many, many, many years ago. But I've kept that blue book because I want to remind myself of this experience that I underwent. And I want to bear record someday. So, well, they tell us by books and pens, we want to teach you how to walk out of bondage into total liberty, freedom, and deliverance. So I get my blue book, get my pen, and I start writing, and I attended that whole week. And so these preachers come, and then they start telling us, you know, the open scriptures of what generational curses are, and then they start teaching us about every curse, every sign of a curse, okay? They start explaining to us how curses come, you know, and every sign that you're under a generational curse. And then they started mentioning almost, you know, all the things that happen in human life. There's a spirit called so-and-so if you iron clothes and burn them. There's a spirit called so-and-so if you make losses in business. There's a spirit called so-and-so if you fail to get married. There's a spirit called so-and-so. And they mentioned, we're not all about telling us what that meant. And they said, we have come to pray for you. And so they prayed for people. You know, uh, people screamed, rolled on the floor, and jacked and all these kind of things. And I saw them. And for us, that was really proof that people were getting delivered because we're seeing the outward sign of manifestation for that. And um, yeah, so that was my understanding about deliverance. And that's the thing I kept sharing with my friends, also sharing what I knew, you know, and had been taught by my friend, by those people. But over the years, when I examined this really, I realized and I followed some of the people because I knew them who fell and screamed and things were screaming out of them by reason of the anointing that was present in the room. And I looked at these people over the years, and they were not really free. In fact, one of the guys that I know very well was in that meeting, rolled on the floor. He actually broke a couple of chairs. One of those fellows, I know very well, his family told me about a year and a half back that he went to witchcraft. He totally sold his soul to devil, and he's using magic and sorcery. He's in the dark world now, but he had an experience where the power of God went through him, Okay. And many others I remember have studied. And if you were a proponent of that or you were taught under that doctrine, you'll testify that, yes, you have short fixes. Your husband could come home. Your children might, you know, get better a bit or you can get a job or two. But if you look at the total sum of your life, you might never see the fullness of the manifestation of God's glory and purpose concerning your life. But, hey, what is that to people who don't even know what the fullness feels like? What is that to people who don't know what the fullness of the Spirit is? Okay? So, because today even the things that come for testimony are not even testimony. Because the church of Jesus Christ has not emphasized the fullness uh, with which we have in Christ. Okay? So today I felt that I would share with you what the law of deliverance is. And I'll read for you in Luke chapter 1, the 68th verse. The Bible says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be served 
from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, we might serve him without fear in holiness and in righteousness before him all the days of our lives. That scripture tells you that from the beginning of time, it was always the intent of God the Father to make sure that you are free. That it's the only guarantee of you serving God. That's why he says that we being delivered from all our enemies, that we might serve God in a freedom, in a liberty, in a newness, without fear. Because you cannot truly be a servant of God when you have not experienced true deliverance. Why? People ask questions. Why are you not free from the very thing that you're preaching about? Why is the thing that you're talking about not working in your life, your family, your relationships, your businesses, your ministry? If it is true that God indeed sets men free, why are you not free? For the Bible says, who saw the Son sets free is free indeed. Now, God tells us through this that we are free indeed that we might be able to serve God without any fear in our hearts, without any worry in your heart, that the thing that you've been delivered from might come back and haunt you and you know, disturb you, you know. Uh, one time, many years ago, I went into a church and I found a wife of a minister and she was praying for people. She was commissioning people for the work of ministry. And then later on, I had an opportunity to preach in the same meeting. And as I started preaching, devils manifested on this woman, the wife of a pastor. And she started undressing herself. And the ashes came to hold her. And I can imagine what happened after that. It wasn't my own doing. I had not even planned to do. I was just teaching. As I was teaching and preaching the word, the power of God was present in that room. And the devils got on two hands. She started undressing herself. And so the ashes go in to cover her. It was a very bad scene. I can imagine what happened to the church members thinking, this is the one, you know, casting out devils out of us. But she harbors quite many. And how many? On how, oh, if she has laid hands on us, what is the implication of that? So I am very conscious of the fact that there are many Christians, many believers, many ministers out there who claim a freedom that they don't actually have in Christ Jesus. Okay? Because we don't understand the law of deliverance, how the law of deliverance works. And that's what I want to take time for. Some of you have diseases in your house that have refused to leave. That probably one or two, three members are suffering from uh, the same diseases. You have seen them moving through. Some of you have had one challenge financial after another challenge financial. Some of you have had frustrations with their children, one child after another. Things have failed to move. Things have failed to change. And you can see that there is a sort of bondage. It is manifested in the things that happen in your own household. Tonight, I want to show you how to really walk free, how to appropriate the law of deliverance and freedom and true liberty in Christ, that you will live a glorious life in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, to understand this, we need to see how Jesus, for example, in this covenant, this new dispensation, viewed, understood, or revealed the law of deliverance, how it worked by the mind of Jesus Christ, all right? Because you see, when you enter a new covenant, a lot of things change. A lot of things change. If any man be in Christ, is a new creation. Behold, the old is past and now the new, and all things have become of God. So when Jesus comes, a lot changes, a lot changes. But many people do not know exactly how Jesus presented deliverance what his mandate and work was touching the law of deliverance. And as we continue to, you know, dig deep into understanding the New Testament and how he viewed deliverance, many of you will appreciate that we have handled this work very, very, very ignorantly. And of course, why? Because many of the examples of the deliverances we see with Jesus were deliverances on folk who are not born again. <laughs> were deliverances on people who had not received him as their Lord and Savior, and Christ had not yet died and raised to glory. So many people use that as reference. Okay? Whatever they see Jesus do, of course they do, and that's okay for those that don't believe. But when it comes to the life of a believer, unfortunately, some believers are oppressed by demons, unfortunately, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, when we start preaching the grace message, a very big uh, contention comes through. Because there's a thought that grace ministers 
do not pray for people for deliverance, okay? And that's not the way. That's not true. Okay, if you have attended our meetings or if you have Googled some of our videos, you will see that I cast out devils, both in unbelievers and believers. Are you hearing me? And this is what I think. I have seen an extreme group of people who are so liberal that they sort of impress on people a faith that is not really to the true revelation of it or to the understanding okay, of what that could imply. And so they teach, teach faith, teach, teach faith. And they're teaching faith to people who are not yet adopted and matured. And before some of these people mature, they die in their unbelief. They die because of the devils that are tormented. And they are afflicted and destroyed. And some of them have consequences that are hard to turn around in that process because they are on the journey okay, of growing into faith to stand on their own. All right? And that is why this is what I believe. I believe that I will teach that freedom, that liberty in Christ, that glory with which we were called. But I also believe that even while we're teaching that liberty and glory, if certain people are still on the way to that space of realization, I should not hold back the responsibility of casting out, demonstrating, and exercising the God-given authority that I have in Christ Jesus to deal with the devil that is tormenting that woman or that man. But after that, I want to get them on the side and teach them as much as I can, so that by the process they can live a free, uh, liberated life in Christ Jesus, so we don't lose them in the process while they're still learning the realities of truth. And because we do that, some people can't really connect. But if you guys are believing in the finished work, then why are you doing this? Because unfortunately, not everybody knows the truth. And some people could be lost in the process while they're trying to understand and to know the truth. But I don't believe that a Christian is supposed to live a perpetual life of bondage into bondage, deliverance service, then bondage, and then deliverance service, then bondage, and then deliverance service, then again bondage, and then deliverance service, and then that life continues to and fro one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and then we have given the impression that that freedom and liberty is only for men of God, the anointed prophets, teachers, and apostles, and pastors of God, and the rest of the people are supposed to be tormented by devils all the way through their lives. People have invested millions and hundreds of thousands of shillings and dollars going for deliverances that have no answer and will never really change them because they have not taken time to know the truth and for the truth to set them free. And that is why I take time to invest in this, to help you understand what is the law of liberty. What did Jesus say? Okay, If we go to Luke, the fourth chapter, the 17th verse, Jesus Christ has come back from the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says he enters into the synagogue. And the 17th verse says, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has set me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and the Bible says he gave it back again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogues were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your eyes. Okay, Jesus is proclaiming a fulfillment of a particular scripture that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, and it had not yet gotten its fulfillment. But after the Son of God is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, he comes back after the testations in the power of the Holy Spirit from Jordan. The Bible says he enters this synagogue and he says, I have started the fulfillment of that particular scripture. And in the fulfillment of that particular scripture, I have been sent to declare, to preach, the Bible says, deliverance to the captives. To preach deliverance for the captives. Now, the word there for preach is keiruso. The Greek word there for preach is keiruso, meaning to proclaim, to herald the good news of a thing that has been done. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. To herald or to preach or to proclaim the thing that has already been done. To publicly speak about a thing that has already been done. And this is what Jesus is saying. When he's preaching deliverance to the captive, he's not promising them that they will be delivered. 
No, but he is coming at the voice that is heralding or speaking forth publicly that actually your deliverance has been given. It has been done by God. All right? And he is the manifestation of that. He's saying that scripture is fulfilled because he, the word of God, has come in the form of a man. He has come as a man. He has come with a mandate and he's saying, in my coming, I want to proclaim to you. I want to preach to you. I want to explain to you. I want to emphasize to you what has already been done. And this is the proclamation of the message that is supposed to go out because I am the beginning of that message. When Jesus Christ comes into this earth, something took place. Something happened both with heaven and earth and in hell. He came to save the world. Okay. So this proclamation, the preaching of deliverance is the experience of sharing with you what has already been done and the manifestation of that God in the person of Jesus Christ in whom all the fullness of God dwelt bodily. It meant that that scripture had been fulfilled through that. Jesus coming meant that that work was going to be carried on to till the end. All right? So the spirit and the law of deliverance really is more of the revelation of the things that have been done but seek manifestation in the physical realm. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. They seek manifestation in the physical realm. That is the mystery of deliverance. You need to go back and understand why really Jesus came and what he came to do on the earth. Okay? Because I'll ask you the ultimate question. Why do we see curses in the lives of people? Why do we see disease in the lives of people? Why do we see bondage in the lives of people? Why do we see failure? Why do we see dismay? Why do we see distress? Why do we see testations? Why do we see demonic oppression and all these things? Why do we see affliction in the world? And you need to understand where it began from. We have to go back from the beginning and see where it began from in the garden. Okay? When man and woman fell, when they ate the forbidden fruit, they disobeyed God and the serpent deceived them that by eating that fruit, they will be as God. And so they fall. And so when they fall, you know, sin has entered into the world just like that. Now the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 23, the sin principle, he says that the wages of sin is death. Okay, the wages of sin is death. So death comes into the world as a consequence of sin. And because death comes into the world as a consequence of sin, the things that lead to death, the things that cause death of any sort or any matter as a result of the sinful nature, the fallen nature of humanity from the first fall of Adam and Eve. Okay, that's similar to that pattern. All right. So when we are born in this world, we are born as sinners, not because we have sinned, but we are born after the nature that rebelled against God and the consequences of death are imminent in our lives. All right? So any matter of death, whether you're talking about physical death and sickness, which perpetually leads to death, if you're talking about poverty, poverty comes because of our sin nature, you know. Demonic affliction comes because of our sinful nature. You know, early untimely deaths come because of our sinful nature. All right? All manner of trouble and testation that could lead to failure and destruction and death are as a result of the sin principle. And I want you to understand this. They are as a result of the sin principle. Okay? So when you note that, then we get to the next space where I have to explain. In that very verse again, it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right? So Jesus comes to bring or to reveal the gift of God which is eternal life through him. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. But remember, he says, I am the true way, the truth, and the life. The Bible says that he that has the Son has life within him. Okay? So when Jesus comes to give life in the space of death, when he comes from the testations of the wilderness led by the Holy Ghost there, and then he comes in the power okay, of the Holy Spirit, we see him transition from his first realm and degree of ministry 
to his second realm degree or dimension of ministry. The first year, the third year or so, he was not, you know, healing the sick or casting out devils. We could hear him in the synagogues arguing with the Pharisees and, you know, debating scripture. But we know that he's growing in wisdom and favor before God. He's doing his carpentry job, but there's nothing to him. Nothing is showing up to him. And so when he goes in the wilderness, he's tested by God in the testations of the Spirit. He comes back in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's entered into his second dimension of ministry. That is the time we start to see the miraculous power of Jesus Christ. But he is spelling something, okay, that to the end the man who reads the word would understand fully. That according to God, known are his works from the beginning, the God who calleth the things that are not as though they are, when Jesus Christ comes into this space and then reads Isaiah, he sees that this is already finished because his work has begun and it's going to be carried to accomplishment. And there's a testimony that is going to be spoken after his death and resurrection, the continuation of that work, but in view and perception of the way we should see them. Jesus did not come to tell men that you're going to be delivered or you should be delivered only, but he came to tell them that there is something God has done and it has guaranteed that you are delivered. I am come to prove that. So when he's casting out devils, he's proving that deliverance. When he's coming to cleanse the leper, he's proving that deliverance. When he's opening blind eyes, he's proving that deliverance. When he's raising the dead, he's proving that deliverance. But they cannot understand it because they have a fallen nature. But he has to go to the fulfillment of that on that cross. That when he goes on that cross and is crucified for the sins of men, and is raised into glory, they will look back into his day and see the demonstration of that power as a sign of the things he was telling them. So they would continue in the way that the Lord has called them, but this time under another covenant. He comes to bring another covenant and to make another one obsolete. It wasteth away. The Bible says it giveth way, okay, for the new covenant, that dispensation of power, the dispensation of life. Okay, And that is why when we understand the wages of sin and their death, we understand the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ. We understand that. Okay, Now I want you to see, this is Romans chapter 6. Paul is trying to build something. He's trying to build something. So we go into Romans chapter 7, the 6th verse, and then you hear Paul saying, but now we are delivered from the law. That's the first thing he mentions. We are delivered from the law that we're being delivered dead wherein we were held, we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. He's saying that the thing that actually used to bring this challenge, the thing that used to open this door of curses, of sickness, of disease, was that there was a law. And that law used to tell us, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. It is, of course, likened to the law in the Garden of Eden, where God tells them that you shall eat of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the law. That was a principle. God had set it and man broke it and the consequence of that sin. So when he brings us the 10 through Moses, all right, this law, the Bible says the law was given that all men might be guilty. That everyone would know that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay? Now when Jesus comes, the Bible tells us the law was the schoolmaster in Galatians that led us to Christ. But after that Christ is come, the Bible says we are no longer under the law. We're no longer under the schoolmaster. He says, why are we no longer under the schoolmaster? Because when the law brings you to Christ, Christ takes over from that day and the law has no business with you. Hallelujah. Now, Paul knows that with the law is the knowledge of sin. With the law is the knowledge of sin. The law is not a guarantee that you're going to be free, but it is the knowledge of sin. That's all it does. It just tells you your sinful nature. It explains how sinful you are. You understand? And the strength of sin is the law. So the Bible says the strength of sin is the law. So if the strength of sin is the law, sin is only empowered where the law is. And remember, the wages of sin is death. So there is no way you'll not earn the wages of sin where the law is Okay, because the law is the strengthener of sin. The law is not the strengthener or imposer of righteousness. He is the strengthener of sin. Okay, so when Adam and Eve is told, do not eat of this fruit, a law has been given in Eden. And that particular law is the very reason why man falls in the first place. So what about the ten that then comes through Moses? 
they're there that all men might become guilty before God and that we might be awakened to the need of the master. That is why when you are not born again, we put you under the law. We tell you, look, the Bible says don't steal, don't kill, don't, you've done one of these at one particular point. You've either lied or cheated or done anything of that. Okay? And you are worthy of death. But the Bible says that there's a free gift through Jesus Christ that translates you from darkness into light that grants you salvation. And it's available for all who believe. That is why the Bible says that he will judge the world of sin, not because they sinned, but because they believed not on the Lord Jesus. They believed not on the Lord Jesus. John 16 verses 9. They did not believe in Jesus. Okay? Now I want you to follow me because I'm going to go a bit deep here. Okay? So, when Paul now comes in Romans 7, he says we are now delivered from the law. Why is he saying we're delivered from the law? Because now we have another man in the place of the law, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. He is standing on our behalf for the law. So I'm not accountable to the law, but I'm accountable to the person of Christ. All right? I'm the law of love. And that law of love is higher than any other law. That is why when love is complete in this revelation, the Bible says besides this revelation of love, there is no law. Jesus Christ comes in the expression of the agape of God. And he comes to reveal to us the love of God. And when we understand that love, the completion of the eternal plan is worked in us. Because no man in love can go against the will and purposes of the law of God. Hallelujah. But we are now established on the premise of life. All right? And so when we understand that, already I'm dealing with those of you who think, oh, I have a generational curse, I have this, yes. The curse was as a result of the law. All right? The curse was as a result of the law. Even in the New Testament, God tries to explain to people that any man under the law is a curse already. All right? The cursing of a man in the New Testament dispensation is only because the man chooses to stay under the law and not embrace the grace of God. That is why men are under a curse. Cursed is he which is cast on the tree. But the Bible says, but he became a curse for us, all right, that we might walk free. So when Jesus Christ becomes the curse because he's cast on the tree, if Jesus went on that tree to become a curse, how can you then carry a curse except you're saying that the work of Jesus Christ was not completed at the cross? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But he has said, but for as many as are under the works of the law, the Bible says in Galatians 3.10, they are under a curse. They are all under a curse. And they're not under a curse because of simply what they have done, but they are under the law because of the understanding that they have in their spirits. Because if they are of the works of the law to seek justification through God, even that thought is enough to put a curse on you, even when you've not done anything. Why? Because you're already taking yourself back to say, even though Jesus Christ came in the place of the law, I have refused Jesus. I still want to do my own business here in the law. You're anti-Christ. If you teach that way, you are anti-Christ. All right? And so he says, cast is everyone that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Why? Because you've put yourself under the law. If you're saying you're under the law, you have to fulfill all the law, which you can't. And that means that you're consequently going to still be under the curse because you're under the works of the law. But for us who have embraced Jesus Christ in the place of the law, and we're saying that I don't have rules to fulfill, but I have a life to live in Christ Jesus, the Bible has guaranteed us freedom and liberty. We cannot speak of true deliverance when the mind is not transformed to what Jesus Christ came to do. And we can pray fast, people scream and roll on the floor. But if we have not understood the doctrine of the Christ, of why he proclaims what is done, why the New Testament church is a proclamation of what is already done in God through Christ Jesus, okay? People should embrace deliverance as something that has already been given through the person of Jesus. But today, many people teach that when you become born again, you still have some generational things, and now you need to undergo deliverance. No, when you become born again immediately, what you need is the transformation of your mind. He says, as babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow in. He did not say that as babes desire deliverance services that you might grow. He says that as babes desire the sincere milk of the word of God that you might grow in. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
It's all in the realm of understanding that when somebody becomes born again, the first thing we do or we must do in the discipleship classes is to teach people what Jesus Christ has done or what God has fulfilled in the face of the person of Jesus Christ. Because once that is explained, they will already see themselves free. So what if they still see things around them that sort of tell them that they're in bondage? Yes, they might see or feel things around them that still tell them that they're in bondage. But now they have to appropriate the higher law of faith to believe what Christ has done. That transformed mind, it comes through the renewal. And that renewal is through the reading of the word. It's the only way men will understand the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God concerning their lives. They have to get rid of the ideals and the attitudes of the world and embrace the word of God and be renewed in the spirit of their mind through the reading of the word. And as the word is read, they get to understand the good, the acceptable, and perfect will of God concerning their lives. And as they continue living that life to understand what God's will is, what God's plan is for their lives, they easily through faith embrace it. And when they embrace that through faith, that light that comes into that space of darkness, which is ignorance, then translates their life to true liberty. Well, if they fall, shake, scream in the process, that's not a problem. But that transformation must take place. It must take place. And we must begin from the power of sin and death versus the life which we have in Christ. And that's why Paul, from that transition of Romans 6, where he's speaking about the wages of sin is death, he introduces the free gift of God, which is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And then he says, and that is what now makes us be free and not under the law. And because we are not under the law, that means we have embraced the grace and the finished work of God in Christ Jesus. And because of that, he says, we serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of life. And that newness is the freshness, the refreshing of the spirit. In other words, every morning you walk refreshing. Imagine what that freshness of spirit should do or would do to your body. Let's just say you have a generational cast where all the people in your family are barren. Imagine what that newness of life would do to your womb. Let's just say you're born in a family where all of them get hypertension. What does that newness of the spirit do? Hallelujah. That is why when he goes into Romans 8, he says, there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And he says, who walk not after the flesh? Who don't pattern their thought, life, or understanding, or mentality after the flesh, but after the spirit? He says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You see the sin principle? Because sin leads to death. So that was a law, the law of sin and death. Now you have a higher law called the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Hallelujah, glory to God. You have another law. It's called the law of the spirit of life in Christ. It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ. And he says, so if you keep that mentality, if you live according to the flesh, you will surely die. You will die because your mentality takes you back to the law. But if you by the spirit kill the transactions of the body, kill the transactions of your life, kill the transactions, the evil and ungodly transactions in your home, kill the ungodly transactions in your business, the ungodly transactions in your children's lives, in your ministry, you will leave. You'll have life. Why? Because you have now a law that appropriates life. And what is that life? Zoe, the very life which is of God himself. The very life which is of God himself. The very life which is of God himself. That is the law that you're under when you become born again. And so the law of deliverance in the New Testament dispensation is 100% subjected to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That is the story. That is the testimony. That is why when Paul now comes into the New Testament, because again, I've emphasized Jesus. Now, I want to talk about the man who laid down the foundation of the New Testament dispensation. Has more books than any man has written. As a master builder, he laid down the foundation of the church. All right? In the very words of Paul, in the book of Acts chapter 26, uh, verse 16, when he's giving his testimony of his uh, translation on the way to Damascus, the Bible says, 
he said in the 16th verse, Acts 26, the 16th verse, now God appears to him and tells him, rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee. This is God now telling Paul, giving him his mandate like it was given to Christ uh, in Luke 4. Okay, This is Paul now receiving his mandate from God. He says, rise, stand upon your feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Listen, to make thee a minister and a witness both of those things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Delivering thee, he says, from the people and from the Gentiles and to whom I send thee. And he says, listen to the mandate, to open their eyes to turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance, listen, among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. He's saying your ministry is simple, to make men see. You just need to put the power of God here and put Satan here. Show them what God has done through Christ Jesus. And as they see that, they are going to receive the forgiveness of sins. And when they receive the forgiveness of sins, that comes also with an inheritance among them that are sanctified through faith. In other words, all we need is to show people what this man, Jesus Christ, has done. You know, the Bible says uh, that through this man, Acts 13, verses 38, he says, Be it known unto you that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Jesus comes to end sin and its power and its consequence. Because he knows if we can end the power of sin and its consequence, men might enter the newness of that spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And when they do that, they're embracing the inheritance that they have in God. And when they embrace the inheritance that they have in God, if we can make them see that, we don't need to cast out devils. If we can make them see that, we don't need the deliverance session of two hours. That's why Paul says, and to whom I'm least of all saints, was given unto me this grace to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. If we can make men see that, it doesn't matter how many devils you cast out, how much they roll, because the devil has understood that by rolling, he satisfies certain ministries that men are free. And, he, you know, he can even fund that because men like to see the spectacular instead of drawing in the supernatural. So it doesn't mean that everybody who falls under the power is under the influence of a devil. But surely some men have benefited, you know, greatly from casting out devils and people rolling on the floor. And you look at people who have rolled, casting out things, things are speaking through them, but they're never really free because we don't cast vision in teaching them. They carry no vision of this revelation. And if they don't carry the vision of this revelation, then no matter how many times they'll fall down, you're not free until the house is filled with revelation. That's why it says you'll cast out a devil out of a man and he shall go in the dry places seeking for a place to rest. And when he goes in the dry places and finds none, it gets seven more devils stronger than it. And the Bible says that it comes back into that house. If it finds that house and there is no word, no revelation, no vision, no understanding of who you are, the Bible says the place of that man becomes worse than he was before. That is why some of you attend prayer meetings, go for overnight, have prophets, pastors, apostles over you, people praying for you every night. You have prayer partners, but things are worsening every day you have this special pastor who prays for you every day and things are worsening they're even putting demands on you that don't exist because you think that by having people on your side and praying with you that that will deliver you know you're never going to walk into freedom until you come to the revelation of the person of jesus christ and what he has done through the cross and god not only wants to do that through you but he wants to use you to deliver many so you understand that deliverance is not just for a few special men of god who sought God on a prayer mountain, who have fasted for the whole year, know that deliverance is for all who believe in Christ Jesus. It's for all who believe in Christ Jesus. And Satan has done a great job to hide this away from the church. People are going deliverance service after deliverance service, prophet after apostle, apostle after pastor, pastor teacher, teacher upon intercessor, intercessor upon that woman who lives somewhere who is very prophetic. She can tell you what you went through. But the very people who are even teaching the same thing are in bondage. They're in bondage of the same stuff. It's like which doctors who promise wealth, but they're in shrines. They're broke and beggarly, but they're promising deliverance, yet they carry no deliverance. And we're saying... You can go all the way you want, go around the world, but you're still going to come to this realization that your eyes have to see this. Your ophthalmos, the Greek word there, your perception of the spirit 
of understanding. Your mind and spirit must conceive this revelation. Because if you don't conceive this, we're wasting time. You're never going to walk a free life. You're never going to walk a free life. And you're not free by telling you every demon that works in your family. Because some of you, when they start speaking, you see everything they're speaking. Every example they use, you eat. And you're like, eh, I'm gone. Because they've had you wise unto that which is evil. Yet, <laughs> Paul says again in Romans, that your obedience has come abroad, all men. Okay? And now, I would rather have you wise. What is your obedience? To believe what Christ has done. He says, your obedience has come abroad unto all men. And he says, and therefore, I'm glad that I would rather have you wise and to that which is good and very simple concerning evil. In the churches today, in some churches that teach deliverance, they speak more about evil than the person of God and good and what he came to do. They tell you this and that. By the time you go through those overnights, those prayer services, by the time you're done, you know every devil in the world, every spirit in the world, eh, marine spirits, air spirits, flying spirits, male, female spirits. You've understood every kind of spirit. And then you get such people and they know all the kinds of spirits and you tell them, what is the central theme of the book of Romans? And they don't know. <laughs> they can't even quote 10 scriptures off their head for the 20 years they have spent, except the scriptures they gave them to fight in warfare against those things that never seek to live. And they also crammed them because they look at them as weapons, not revelation. They look at those scriptures as weapons to use like, but they don't get the revelation, the foundation of why the word of God was given us. So Jesus appears to Paul to send him to open the eyes of men. That as they open their eyes of men to the power of God, they might turn from darkness into light. And when they turn from darkness into light, they receive forgiveness of sins. And when they receive forgiveness from sins, the next line there and say, then... When they're born again immediately, they undergo a deliverance service. No, immediately after the receiving of the forgiveness of sins, the Bible tells us they enter into the inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. The moment they receive forgiveness of sins, the next thing we see is inheritance. We see the inheritance of power. We see the inheritance of life. We see the inheritance of joy. We see all the good things which are in them, which are in Christ, given everything that pertains to life and godliness, blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For he that held not his son, will he not with his son give you all things freely? So the revelation of that inheritance stirs your spirit. And before you know it, if anything comes contrary to what you have in Christ, you have the God-given mandate and right to say, devil, I refuse. My family won't fail. My children won't fail. My body won't be sick. I don't look like the man that begat me anymore. The system that is running in my veins cannot carry diabetes from one generation to another. Why? Because I'm of a new creation and all things are become new and they are of God, I'm reconciled to God, I'm one with God, for he that is joined uh, to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. I and God are inseparable. I'm his son, I'm his seed. I carry his DNA permanently. And as you continue claiming those things, strength comes. The Bible says he sent his word and healed all their diseases. The Bible says he delivered them from all their destructions. What did he do? He didn't send a deliverance service. He sent his word in the person of Jesus Christ. The scripture was fulfilled. Isaiah was fulfilled in the life that came through the person of Jesus. And that is why in Jeremiah, when it comes into this generational curses, uh, 31, uh, from the 29th verse, and I want to finish. He says, in those days, they shall say no more that the fathers have eaten a sour grape and the children's teeth are set on the edge. You will never say that again. That the curse on your father and what your father did, your father killed someone. And therefore, you as a child, you're going to pay the price of your father's murder. You understand? God has promised. He's saying, no, no, no. That saying will not be said in that dispensation. So no New Testament creature actually has the right anymore to speak of a generational curse. 
unless you don't know what Jesus Christ did. The Bible says that everyone shall die for his own iniquity. And why are people dying of sin? Because they receive not Jesus. If you receive Jesus, you shall live and not die. You know, for the Bible says the thief cometh but to steal, kill, and destroy. But he says, but I am come that you might have life and life to the fullest. That you might have it more abundantly until it overflows. I'm come that you might have the life of God until it overflows. What is that life to cancer, to HIV, to uh, incurable diseases, to poverty, to breakage and destruction and sorcery and witch? What is that power to that? These things cannot match anywhere. They're destroyed at the sound of that name. So he says, every man that shall sin shall die, and every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on the edge. And he says, behold, the days come said the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This is the new covenant. This is where you and I are in 2020. He says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. The law broke. They broke it. They broke the Ten Commandments. They broke everything. And now he says, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. I won't tell them do this or do that. No. The word, the law is in their spirits. You and Christ are one. Christ in you. This is the mystery that was hid from the ages past and now revealed Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Christ, the word, resides in the inside of you through faith. That may Christ dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being deeply rooted and grounded in love, you'll know the depth, the height, and all the width of the love of God. And because of that, the Bible says then that you might come to the knowledge of that love of Christ which passes all knowledge and understanding and that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, not the devil. The fullness of God. The Amplified says that you might become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. So, he says, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And verse 34, he says, and none shall teach every man his neighbor saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them and to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. And listen, and I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. When God deals with the sin principle, after that is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And that is for redemption. That is for glory. That is for inheritance to them that are sanctified by faith in him. When you understand that doctrine, you have understood the law of deliverance. The law of deliverance is a proclamation of what Christ has already done or what God has done through Christ on the cross. Do you know what God has done? It's where now you stand and say, okay, I refuse this because it is written that through Jesus Christ, this is the truth. You can say that. Or if you won't say, we'll help you by teaching you. If you don't get it, will cast out devils out of you, roll you, you'll flip, flop, you scream, head down, your wig will fall off, your bags will fall, you know, your shoes will come out and you'll go back home dirty and it will leave you for a season. And if you don't get this revelation, we'll still pray and you'll still roll down, you understand, until you get to this revelation. If you don't, it's up to you. You can have a short fix while it is gone, but you're never going to have the guarantee of true liberty and freedom in Christ Jesus until you understand what God has done in the face of Jesus Christ. So I want you to raise your voice and thank God for Jesus. For who saw the sun sets free, the Bible says they are free indeed. Free. I just want you to take time and thank God for the freedom with which you have in Christ Jesus. I just want you to see that tonight I proclaim to you what has already been done, that you have been delivered, that you being delivered from your enemies, that is the devil and all the unreasonable and wicked people, he says that you will serve God without fear. And that's what makes you a free person. 
That's why we serve God. You serve God because you know you're free. I want you to thank God, and as you're thanking God, I want you to look at the issue that has been pressing you most. Uh, and now I'm speaking to people who have seen, you know, diseases in, in your families coming generational to generational, hypertension generational to generational, diabetes generational to generational. You know, some of you, you're suffering from incurable, you know, diseases. You saw the same diseases in your family. Your cousins and uncles have died of the same. Certain things seem as though they are patterns that come even from generations two and three back, whether it's poverty that is generational. I want you to appropriate what Christ has done or what God has done through the person of Jesus and receive it as yours and tonight claim your freedom and say, because of this, I will not struggle. Because of that, my children will not struggle. Because of this, my family will not struggle. I'm a new creation in Christ. Behold, the old is past and now all things have become new and all things are of God. Greater is he which is in me than he that is in the world. I thank you, God, because your word is true. I will not look like the past. If they ate bitter fruits, my teeth or our teeth will not be set on the age. We don't know how they believed, but we are sure on how we believe. Maybe our great-grandparents were not believers, but you are a believer now. You have believed God. And nothing evil or dark has any right over your life because you're a new creation. Father, we thank you for what Jesus did, for what you have done to send your son to proclaim liberty, to preach deliverance to the captives, for who saw the son set free. They're free indeed. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Great miracles are happening right now. Diseases are healing. Poverty is living. Struggle is living. Families are being reconciled. You're going to settle in your marriage in the name of Jesus. If you've not seen people marry in your family, you're going to be the first. Because you're under no curse. You are the blessed of the Lord. You're blessed going in and blessed going out. You're blessed in the city. You're blessed in the country. All that you do is blessed. Everything you touch is blessed. Everywhere you go is blessed. Just receive that in liberty. Receive that with your vision. You clench to it. And your eyes should see it. That it is actually done in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the law of the spirit of life in Christ. That has set us free from anything that could die or should die. And now we live and we live forever in Jesus mighty name we have prayed and believe amen hallelujah give the lord a mighty hand clap of praise wherever you are at home in your car wherever you're driving and thank god for jesus for who saw the sun sets free the bible says they are free indeed free i just want you to take time and thank god for the freedom with which you have in christ jesus i just want you to see that tonight i proclaim to you what has already been done, that you have been delivered, that you've been delivered from your enemies, that is the devil and all the unreasonable and wicked people. He says that you will serve God without fear. And that's what makes you a free person. That's why we serve God. You serve God because you know you're free. I want you to thank God and as you're thanking God, I want you to look at the issue that has been pressing you most. Now I'm speaking to people who have seen, you know, diseases in your families coming generational to generational, hypertension generational to generational, diabetes generational to generational. You know, some of you, you're suffering from incurable, you know, diseases. You saw the same diseases in your family. Your cousins and uncles have died of the same. Certain things seem as though they are patterns that come even from generations two and three back, whether it's poverty that is generational. I want you to appropriate what Christ has done or what God has done through the person of Jesus and receive Receive it as yours and tonight claim your freedom and say because of this I will not struggle because of that my children will not struggle because of this my family will not struggle I'm a new creation in Christ behold the old is past and now all things have become new and all things are of God 
Greater is he which is in me than he that is in the world. I thank you, God, because your word is true. I will not look like the past. If they ate bitter fruits, my teeth or our teeth will not be set on the eight. We don't know how they believed, but we are sure on how we believe. Maybe our great-grandparents were not believers, but you are a believer now. You have believed God. And nothing evil or dark has any right over your life because you're a new creation. Father, we thank you for what Jesus did, for what you have done to send your son to proclaim liberty, to preach deliverance to the captives. For whoso the son sets free, they're free indeed. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Great miracles are happening right now. Diseases are healing. Poverty is living. Struggle is living. Families are being reconciled. You're going to settle in your marriage in the name of Jesus. If you've not seen people marry in your family, you're going to be the first. Because you're under no curse. You are the blessed of the Lord. You're blessed going in and blessed going out. You're blessed in the city. You're blessed in the country. All that you do is blessed. Everything you touch is blessed. Everywhere you go is blessed. Just receive that in liberty. Receive that with your vision. You clench to it. And your eyes should see it. That it is actually done in Christ Jesus. Thank you Lord Jesus. Thank you for the law of the spirit of life in Christ. That has set us free from anything that could die or should die. And now we live and we live forever. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed and believed. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord the mighty hand clap of praise wherever you are at home, in your car, wherever you're driving. Just thank God for what he has done in your life. I feel something has happened today. Something remarkable has happened today. But I cannot close this set without giving you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you're there, you say, you know what? I feel I need this God. I feel that I need to be translated from darkness into light. What I was teaching you, your eyes were to see it. And if your eye has seen it, and you feel in your heart that this is your day, and I believe it's your day or night, there is no other day, there is no greater day. You should not wait for the most comfortable conditions or situations because you cannot guarantee what's going to happen tomorrow or next week before you enter the church. But you can receive Jesus now as your Lord and Savior. For the Bible says there is no name under the earth or in the earth or in heaven by which men are saved except the name of Jesus Christ. No name is given among men. And that is the name that is the way, the truth, and the life. You cannot get to the Father except through him. And if you are there and you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying for my sins and becoming the propitiation the ultimate sacrifice for me and tonight I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior I'm born again Amen The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International For more information contact us on telephone number 041 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.